Hello and welcome to Let's Make Treks. I'm Peter and this is TT120 Rambler. Joining me today for a ramble, I have two very special guests. We have Martin Weaver, brand MD at Hornby Hobbies and Carl Hart, product development manager. So let's run the intro and we'll start the interview. All right, good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Good morning. Okay, so uh, for people watching, would you mind uh, introducing yourselves and tell us a little about uh, what you do with Hornby, uh, specifically in relation to TT? Okay, so my name's Carl Hart. I'm the Product Development Manager for Hornby. And so I've been working on TT from sort of the very beginnings, really. Um, you know, Simon first sort of got the project underway um, must be five years ago now and we've been trying you know been working on it and developing it for uh, ever since then i'm martin weaver i'm the um the brand md for, for hornby um so kind of my, my role is that I sort of I, I oversee um mainly kind of the marketing side of it and, and, and anything really that's going on that is particular to, to the railway brand within within the hornby hobbies portfolio um i i kind of have joined um in in this role um quite late on in the in the since the launch of tt but i i have actually been um on and off with the company since 2008 so um, whilst i wasn't um working directly on hornby tt whilst it was being worked on in the in the kind of the quiet and that you know i had some awareness but at that time i was uh, focused on scale electric so i'm kind of um, joining the party a little bit later, uh, but I have some familiarity with the scale actually, because many, many, many years ago, uh, we launched a range of TT scaled um, Corgi locomotives on the brand name Rail Legends, and they were actually TT I scaled. I have on the hand, actually. Uh, you have on the hand, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, that that was a kind of a project. I think that's probably going back to around about 2011 or 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, that that's Hornby Hobbies is is first ever TC project, but not um, obviously <laughs> to the same um, size as what we're doing now on, on the more railway side of things. Excellent, thank you. All right, so getting into the meat of it, um, how have you found um, TT One Hundred and Twenty as far as a uh, success goes? Is it meeting? company standards is it average is it a little bit below where is it, it all sitting it's 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 actually i mean and it, it always kind of depends on on how how you determine the success of it um if you look at it kind of more from a, a commercial and sales perspective um it's meeting expectations um some areas sort of stronger than others um you know when we originally sort of set out the plan of what we were going to do at what stage and we're not kind of really too far off that so that that means that essentially it, it, it's delivering um in areas where it's probably more positive and 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 the real key part of it as well is with, with sets you know we we actually have sold more sets at a quicker rate than what we thought we would as a result of that especially on, on the east and the set that's um spent you know a good few months since launch actually out of stock which is a huge huge positive um, and you know, if we had that in stock, you know, uh, continuously, you know, potentially it could be even bigger than it is now because of, you know, it, essentially everyone really needs a set to get started with TT. Mm -hmm. um, so on that side of it, it's actually sort of deemed to be perhaps a greater success than what we we would have envisaged. Okay, excellent. So um, I think this one might be more for Carl. Um, how long does it take to produce a model from just an idea to an in stock item on the shelf? <clears throat> Well, with the um, the very first TT models, it was <clears throat> well over three years. Um, that was due to us learning, you know, along the way, um, the designers learning. We had a new track system to develop, new motors to use, you know, and factories to develop as well. You know, they've got to learn how to manufacture these things. So. But for a normal for a normal project, it's probably around eighteen months to two years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's from, that's from that's from start of design. Okay, so if I throw some ideas at you later, <laughs> eighteen months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, more specifically, into the uh, TT side of things, 
Um, the first thing I have on my little list here is um, the online community in regards to uh, TC120. There's been this great debate. Um, you may or may not uh, enjoy me asking this question. Um, it's regarding Helgen and their pulling out of uh, TT120 because um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but apparently uh, the models that you guys decided to release were so on the money that they matched what they were going to release and they evidently pulled out. So I'm not going to get into um, who was first or any of that nonsense, but um, would Hornby welcome other manufacturers coming into the TT120 market, specifically for locomotives and rolling stock? Um, yeah, yes, it would. And, and, and it's, it's actually um, kind of quite quite a difficult one to, to sort of answer, really, because, you know, obviously in business, if you have no competitors, you have a 100% market share, you, you own it, you drive it, everything. So, you know, there's a kind of a, a commercial thought process will, will make people think, well, no, we don't want competition. No, you spend your life normally fighting competition. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, how we're sort of, we, we, we're programmed, I suppose, in in, in in majority of businesses, in majority of industries, if not all. But if you spin it around another way, and, you know, we, we, we are talking about a hobby here, and it's a hobby of a certain size, and we have and, you know, a lot of direct contact with, with our consumers, the people that um, are playing with our products, essentially operating our products, modeling our products. And um, we want them to be happy. You know? And if they're not happy, we know about it because they come and talk to us as a show, they comment on social media, they write into us, they write into magazines. So we, we all kind of know about it and we all want to be happy. And that's, that's what we, we, we're sort of essentially here to do. And we know that we cannot produce everything overnight. You know, what, what would be the amazing scenario would be to make everyone happy. You produced every single model in every single ear and every single livery and it came out this price. Da-da. It's just not doable. It's just not my at all. <laughs> so um, you, you, you kind of have to then accept that you've got people that who are really wanting to get into this. And, and we can only do it at a certain rate. And like any other manufacturer could only do it at a certain rate. So someone else coming into TT is better for the whole, For it's, it's kind of essentially better for everyone. Um, so, so for that reason, I, I would welcome it. The, the only thing I'll add to that is if there's any manufacturers watching, please don't do the same models as us. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there's plenty of choices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, just briefly touching on that, um, specifically the uh, Class 31, um, is there any more headway with that or is it still just a name in a catalogue as it stands? So. Uh, well, yeah, we, we've started. We started design on it now. Yeah. Okay. So, eighteen months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We never, never. Yeah. I won't hold you to that. Don't worry. The, the class thirty-seven is is. I think it's quite widely known that 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 after the the sixty-six, that's from a from a diesel traction is the next one in the pipeline. You you would have seen the doubt where we're at without the stage, without <laughs> that, and and you know, and and another one has to follow quite quickly. Awesome, thank you. Uh, uh, moving on a little bit, um, I'm going to try not to be uh, repetitive here because I, I know you did the interview with uh, Peachy and Matt Trains and they touched on this quite heavily. Um, the HSTs, the Class 43s, uh, you're releasing the uh, new starter set with the uh, flying banana version. Um, it has been pointed out that the running numbers are exactly the same in the set as they are in the individual release that's out right now. Yeah. Um, something that has been, I suppose, enjoyed by uh, collectors, fans and the like is that the stuff that comes in the starter set is exclusive to that set. You can't get those names and numbers elsewhere. Um, so again, without being repetitive, I know you went over this with uh, Peachy about why the numbers are what they are. It's a certain set, isn't it? That all the coaches match with the power cars. So a thought I had, uh, whether it's too late in the stage to do this or not, is uh, would it be possible to swap the numbers on the power car and the dummy so that there is some slight exclusivity to that set? So that, that would mean you'd leave the coach in the set with the existing numbering and it would mm -hmm. just be... 
Yeah, I think I think the only issue with doing that is that it wouldn't necessarily be of a true thing that those locos would have been the, the relevant coaches for it. I think that would be the the challenge act, I and mean, I don't think they swapped around a huge amount in working life. Um, when I say swap, I mean take the motor from <clears throat> the motor and put it in the dummy. Yeah, I know, I, I see what you're saying, but um, well, you can do that anyway <laughs> if you if you buy well, a set. Just... I mean, you're not really getting anything different there, are you? I mean, it's not entirely no, but for the people that don't necessarily want to take a screwdriver to their models and just want to leave them as is it was just an idea just so you could still argue further down the line that the sets are somewhat exclusive in think, their contents i think I, I i i completely kind of get why why people would want that as big but it and it's it's almost much more of a, a collector mentality and um yes of course people will collect tt as they do in double o but one of the things that we know at the moment with tt if we were to look at double o and we, we were to kind of cut it into segments between people who collect and people who kind of let's say operate and play that you know that that split is quite significantly different to what it is in tt in the sense that the percentage of people who are buying tt to essentially operate it is very 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 high so right now, that collector element of it is a, a really, really tiny percentage. And if we sat here in five years' time, that, that percentage would probably look different. I don't know that, but it would probably look different. History would say it would be. That's when maybe a bit more of that kind of mentality on exclusivity or um, making it, let's say, appealing for people to buy multiples um, would probably become a bigger thing. Whereas at the moment, we we would rather you know if, if we were investing in in buying a rake of coaches to go with it we we would rather have more variants available in different liveries to hit different regions regions or potentially different eras to, to kind of broaden it than having two lots of the um of the same livery mm -hmm. at this stage that will change you know when, when, once those coaches or the um the the drive unit as and the dummy as a set. Once you know, once they've um, once they've essentially sold through, um, and there will be obviously a, a, a next wave of people who want to potentially buy it in that livery. That that's when we would look to to change the running numbers on both. So, uh, so Keith Park was obviously one that I was looking to change the identity to. So, um, if uh, that. So another question I didn't actually think of until just now. Uh, when it comes to uh, producing liveries and names, um, do you need licensing for preserved locomotives, and does that increase the cost in any way? It, yeah, so it, it, it is very dependent on, um, on on what it what it actually is. Um, so if you go kind of a hard and fast legal route, it all comes down to kind of IPs and trademarks, and that then is always a factor. But a big part of it is is is, is about kind of relationships and, and supporting and access and marketing opportunities. So kind of where possible, we um, if we do something that's kind of preserved or current, we we will we'll try and have a kind of conversation with who it sits with now for, for for those reasons. On occasion, it can be a restriction, but I think that's very very rare that that would happen. It's probably I deem it as more of an opportunity. Um, but it, yeah, it, it really depends on, on on who it sits with. So I know you've done a lot of work with the uh, National Railway Museum in the past. Yeah. Well, obviously, you have to fly in Scotsman, Mallard and all that business. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely. And, and, and also, for, you know, from a, a marketing standpoint and also from a, a research standpoint as well, you know, there's, they're, they're an entity that we work very closely with. Briefly mentioned uh, flying Scotsman and Mallard there. <laughs> uh, during the original, re well, the releases that are still currently available, actually, um, there was quite a bit of... Um, comment about the lack of the front couplers on the specifics um is there any potential for a fix in the future because i know there is a screw hole just in the front of the bogey is that something that could potentially be looked at well the, the, what we what we the reason it hasn't got a front coupler is as you know it's you know it's not that kind of locomotive and you know if you run it prototypically you don't really see mm. um a3's towing a lot of things but um what we what we were worried about when we were developing it is the the weight on the bogey. <clears throat> so when it's going, going through points, you want as much weight in the in the front bogey as possible. Otherwise, you've got to start adding spring uh, stronger springs, and then you've got the potential of lifting the front wheels of the of the loco off the track and, and things like this. So 
it's something we will look at, but I'm not going to commit to it at the moment. Um, for the most part, yes, A4s and A3s and the A1s, they all obviously ran in the forward direction. Uh, but I'm, it might just be a personal thing, but I uh, deal quite a lot in preservation mm. and uh, rail tours, that kind of thing. So uh, seeing an A4 running backwards on, the, let's say, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, tender first that was something that uh initially i had wanted to do an end-to-end -end layout where it comes into the station runs around and then drags it backwards again and then uh obviously i couldn't do that so i've had to settle for a roundy roundy <laughs> uh, that's, okay. uh, that's, that's, my that's a fair point interest. yeah that's a fair point okay mm. yeah we're that's looking to it <laughs> yeah uh we'll touch back on the preservation stuff a bit later on but um let's see uh Talking, going back to the uh, exclusivity side of things, there was um, an image that went out early on for the uh, TT120 Collectors Club, uh, very specifically a, uh, a little red van. So um, was that just a uh, publicity image? Was that ever planned? And is there anything similar in the pipeline for the club? I, I believe it was um, more of a kind of a publicity based thing, um, but there, there, there is an option to potentially looking at doing something like that. You know, obviously we, um, Oxford have a range of vehicles so that there could be an opportunity in that, but we, we haven't got anything in the pipeline right as, as, as we speak. Um, the, the TT 120 club is, um, say compared to the double O club is much more of a, a, a digital based thing. Um, and as as TT evolves and um, it, it gets bigger, as it, you know, following the route it's going now, then the opportunity to be doing um, things which are kind of more on an exclusive basis, even if they're not necessarily rolling stock, but something to go with a railway, that those, those things will start to come into play. Um, and, it, and it's kind of all all about a kind of a timing thing, really. But you know, that that's something which isn't really probably ideally for a year one, maybe not even a year two, but around that year year three mark at the rate of at the current run rate, that's when those things would start to kick in. Right, so uh, looking at the um, new catalogue that's come out recently, obviously there's uh, been some things that have been uh, bumped out. Um, the first one, and this extends to the website as well, this first one, um, the Blue Class 08, um what's the status on that as the moment because the feeling is it may have been discontinued um it, it's 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 been and gone and uh so that's something to for us to look at you know what we have to remember with tt <coughs> is you know I, I had someone actually come to me at a show saying you know why why did you do the, the red db 08 you know, why, why why do that you know what what and who knew at the beginning what was going to be the most popular era of things you know how people are going to go about modeling it are they going to are they going to all follow the exact same route in which what they do in um in double o you know and and the, the the early signs are that it's not that they're not exactly the same at all and you have therefore you have a, a that br shunter was one of the, the very first things to essentially sell out Yes, you know it's it's kind of um, slightly different price point. You can use it in a different way on a, on, a, on a layout, but that that's then becomes a learning. Um, but yeah, that, if we know that's a, a popular area, then then we will do another. And kind of maybe linking this back to one of the earlier questions is: Will we bring that same one back again? No, we won't. We'll probably do another running number, um, and and that's because we then have the opportunity to do it because it's essentially um, been and gone. Okay. So for anyone that has a blue 08 shunter right now, that would now be deemed sort of a collector's item, maybe? Yes, potentially, yeah. 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 I've seen secondhand ones going on eBay for retail price already. So sky's the limit on that one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Especially good, if they haven't been altered. <laughs> that's great. You know, that, that that's good, of course, for people that have in, in and I always kind of like to see things going out like that, because it means that someone has invested in something and for some reason they don't want it or need it anymore they want to free up their money to buy something different like whatever it is so to, to see something kind of holding its market sort of market price is, is a hugely positive thing mm. they are lovely little things the always so also in the catalog with the uh, class 50s um i mean hopefully they'll be released by the time this video goes out but uh 
we'll see what happens with that one. Um, more specifically, the uh, GBRF version, the one I wanted, <laughs> has been bumped back to yeah. 2025, apparently. So um, was uh, what was the reason behind pushing that livery back? So what it was is that you know we we we'd kind of with the whole of TT we'd we'd sort of shown a a, a lot up front, and what actually we we then needed to do on certain things, and this being one of them, um, was just kind of pull back on the the amount we were bringing out at one time. You know what, what we have to be kind of considerate here as well is that you know if, if we if we're going to produce like a quite a decent number of um, each of these locomotives, is that you know you've got it's not just about us committing to stock or us committing factory capacity. It's also about retailers as well, you know, kind of having sort of too many variants of things. And we just took a sort of decision on that, that, that let's take, you know, take it, take it down by one and then come back with that one slightly later. So it, it, it will come. Um, and I, 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 I believe you're right. It is at the moment penciled in for um 25 but you know the, the product will be developed ready so there there is a slim chance that date could be become a bit more positive potentially i'm not promising that though okay um see if i can find a question for carl you've been a bit quiet over there <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so um are you familiar with the works of uh, this way works on youtube no no um well, the guy basically um, he takes apart locomotives and basically just, upgrades them. I was just the guy that put the um, the sound into the 08. Uh, the lights and the sound. Yeah. In the 08. Um, so, <clears throat> with that in mind, um, is there what's the potential for adding sound and lights for uh, the 060 locomotives in the future? Lights and sound. And a power bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not going to say it's out of the question, um, but I've actually seen his video on how how he's fitted it in there at the moment. I mean, I'm guessing he's had to uh, severely modify the model to do that. Um, mm. So I'm not going to say it's out of the question, but uh, at this stage, we're, we're not looking at it. We we have <clears throat> just you mentioned the J50. Did you mention the J50 there? Um, my original question yeah. uh, was 08 slash J50. I've got yeah, so, a bit of paper here. So, um, the, for the, any the, smaller, yeah, the, the, the J50 we have actually designed um, the space for speakers and, and things in oh, there. Oh, excellent. Um, but you know, as we, we're still working on our sort of six, it's going to take a six pin uh decoder that that loco and we still need to develop a six pin sound uh decoder so anyone wanting to fit at this stage anyone wanting to fit sound into that model will need to use a alternative decoder okay um i will add a card at the end of the video for um this way works and what he's done to the oa if uh, no one has seen it but he has uh, taken some material from the inside of the <coughs> uh, shell from the oa so learning what i've learned today if you've got blue 08s, don't modify them just yet. Hang on to them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. That, that might turn into a thing. <laughs> okay, so um, in relation to that, um, is there any potential for smaller power banks? Because I have yeah. seen people struggling to get them inside uh, the tenders and obviously same thing with the smaller locomotives as well. Yes, yeah, so we have just finished development on, on our power bank. We've revised the design of it now. And it is a lot smaller. It's about, I'd, I'd say it's probably uh, 30 to 40 percent smaller. Impressive. Look forward to seeing that. Yeah. I'm sure Peach would be happy about that as well. He loves his power banks. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving forward, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to uh, choosing a design for a model, would you say modern traction is uh, overtaking steam? In recent times is is that specific to tt or across the world um, in railways in general i think because i know you mentioned in uh, peach's mm -hmm. interview that the uh class 43s have outsold some of the steam locomotives yes yeah, so so we, we we've seen that in tt i i would say across the kind of the the, the broader spectrum of um rails we've been double o into play as well um it still is it's still kind of quite equal 
Um, but then, you know, if, if, we, if we were to sort of you know, hit a rewind button and turn the clock back sort of 20 years ago, then, you know, then, then Steam, no doubt, would have been um, holding a much greater sort of share of it. So I think I think over time, um, obviously, diesel and also um, more, much more modern traction has kind of, um, with more models being produced, has kind of, let's say, kind of eaten into that sort of percentage share. But it's not, we, we don't see it kind of changing at any um, any, any rapid rate. And, and, and the other thing as well, of course, with the, the differences, and it all depends on what the steam is, that if you've got people who are going by region, there's much more chances that something that's more sort of diesel or, or BR um, era would have covered a bigger part of the country. So you, 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 in some ways, you can kind of open it up, you know, in, in steam, you know, the first launch is well in ER, which obviously makes it kind of almost exclusive to one railway, unless of course you're talking about people that are modeling for their railways, which then throws another kind of thought process into it. So yeah, you know, the, 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 the HSTs, um, again depending on livery would, would, have, would have potentially covered that a little bit more ground so i, I think that is also a, fa a factor in it as well okay because um my way of thinking i don't know uh, what experience you may or may not have had uh with um research in this area but um do you feel that people are modeling more what they can see out their window today or are they remembering their childhood when it comes to what models they pick? I, I think it's a bit of all. I, I really, really do. And then I, I also think there's a big percentage of people that don't think about it this deeply as well. They they like a particular thing and they'll have it running through that. I think people, I think they some people do base it on their own experiences. <clears throat> some people base it on um, almost like a kind of a, a fictional life of having their own railway and what it would look like but incorporating things. I don't think there is a, a one brushstroke answer to all of it. And that is one of the great things about the hobby. And, and, and maybe maybe this difference is different between different markets as well. I think there's a huge amount of creativity and, and that kind mm -hmm. of creativity um, allows people um, to kind of go beyond certain boundaries. And that just that, that makes it all the more exciting and it makes it all a bit more unique um and you know if, if you if you follow a lot of like model railway press you know you generally find it's quite kind of channeled in a way and there's certain readers like things but then when you go out into um into social media i think it gets much broader and then when you talk to people at shows i think it gets even broader then and i think sometimes these people don't kind of want to necessarily show or promote what they, they they've done in that way because they know it's 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 more their own thinking and their own keeping it's their own little, little world and that perhaps fear that without being able to explain that, that people won't like it. So sadly, well, I say sadly, it, it, there is no clear answer to it. But at the same time, that's what makes the hobby, I think, bigger and, and, and exciting than if it was all 100% focused on 100% reality. And if it's not real, it can't can't happen. I think I think the big difference for me is we're in double oak age. You know, you get some customers who buy the model to use it on their layout. And you get some customers who want to put it in a display case and they're really, really, you know, really got an eye for all the de little details on the model. Rocket think counts, as we call them this side. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but um, <laughs> on, on TT, uh, it, people want to use the models. You know, they've got a layout. <clears throat> they want they want the model on the layout and they want to play with it. And I think that's the... That's the they're the operators, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, they're operators as well. And, so I think that's the key difference for me. Yeah. With that in mind, um, would it be, as far as um, the steam side of things goes, would it be beneficial to focus future releases on stuff that might be available on preservation railways? Not necessarily the exact name and number, but the designs. I know there's quite, you've got the, um, what is it, the J94, tank engine somewhere in the pipeline i know and they're everywhere on heritage railways so that's one i'm particularly looking forward to and then obviously the option comes up for people like myself who are a little bit impatient maybe to change the number and the name depending on if we uh, are local to certain railways and we have favorites and that type of thing so is there that kind of consideration when it comes to picking locomotive designs? I, th I think the, um, like the, 
the opportunity on look at it from a demand perspective um yes there will always be a demand for them because it's kind of something you can still go and see now but then you know how many people are modeling preserved versus you know a, a, in within period that that's a, a little bit of an unknown i mean that the biggie of course is is perhaps the marketing side of it you know if you've got the miniature version of a real thing it, it can make quite an e exciting story but we we will venture into doing things that are are preserves um and around you know it's not it's not something that is our kind of our main chase but it's it, it does fit part of the overall balance of what we <clears> want to do and and and, and there will be I and mean, we are, I already know of some that, that will be preserved locos that we will be doing in in the not too distant future as well so yeah it, it will be coming mm -hmm. okay so um that's more for like deliveries and that kind of thing. If you look at, I'm not sure if uh, Bluebell ever ran in that livery in its uh, running life. Obviously, that's a preserved livery they've slapped on it. So that one might be a very niche thing. I know there's uh, double O models out there of that one. But for, um, say, BR standards, they only ever came in BR black. So mm -hmm. if you've got a preserved example in model, it would, in theory, be exactly the same as it was in the 60s give or take yeah yeah and that, that, that those things then do um pose kind of that sort of then risk of how many kind of opportunities of, of the broadness of, of appearance of it of how many releases you can do so yeah having a preserved one in in that instance is, is definitely a huge plus with the uh toolings you currently have um how easy would it be to relivery some of the models you already have so uh, the A4, all the Gresley Pacifics, uh, just narrow it down, and the uh, the Mark Ones, because I know there's at least three other liveries that the Mark Ones can go in that I can think of four that I can think of off the top of my head. So, um, so same with the 08 that we touched on earlier. That's come out of the catalog, the blue version and the green ones yeah. going in. Is that something that's likely to happen with uh, other models? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we we um, we, we kind of um, it's utilising the tooling, it's the casting, and it would always be in the plan. Um, and it's really about kind of trying to build in a way that you've got the right loco to go with the right the right um, rolling stock over a period of time, but with bringing it out at a um, a controlled and correct pace. So yeah, yeah, yeah definitely we'll be utilising those tools again mm -hmm. um, in the future. So if a certain um... For an example, let's say a certain A4 were to sell out. Would the knee-jerk response to be to just put it back into production or would there be a conversation of maybe we can do a different number now or name or livery? Yeah, yeah. In, in most instances, it's a, a, a different um, a different livery. Um, there are certain things which um, kind of perhaps a bit more like kind of almost evergreen or they're, they're things that, you know, people are starting out their journey. It might be one of the things they definitely want to start with. You know, in, in double O, for example, we always try and have a man up and flying Scotsman available at any time, whether it's a high detail version or whether it's railroad because of that, you know, they are the, um, the most iconic and, you know, where something we have to be careful is that whilst we, you know, we, we are going on a journey here, we were, in, we were sort of in year two of TT and then 10 years will be in year 12. There will still always people be joining at the very very beginning and they they still you know they're not going to want to sort of um necessarily be wanting the new stuff that's coming at that time they're going to be wanting what um what what are the, the right things to begin with um so yeah certain things will always kind of we'll try and have an arrange um but the majority of which we we try and kind of re refresh so you can have you know who, who not many people some do but not many people want you know a layout with eight manars on it but they might want eight different a a fours you know if they're doing a particular they might like a fours they'd be quite happy for them to be different periods of time but or some of them may want a specific period of times so they all look very similar but have different, different numbers and names um so yeah we definitely majority of time it is a different um a different loco with different numbers or name hmm. so you mentioned uh people collecting x amount of uh a fours out. I'm actually trying to assemble myself my own mini great gathering. Okay. In, uh, TT 120 at the moment. So obviously that includes name changes, number changes on yeah. certain, certain locomotives. But uh, that brings me into my next point. It, would there be any potential to 
purchase individual shell pieces. So for example, I am trying to put together, I've already cracked this up once before, but Dominion of Canada here. Now, if I were to buy a Mallard model with the intention of putting this one together, I would need a corridor tender in blue, garter blue, which is obviously not available directly at the moment. Even if I were to kit bash another model, it would involve me uh, pulling apart another model and repainting it. So um, I think uh, I've written down here some. Um, in the 60s, there were CKD kits where you put the locomotive together yourself. So would there be any potential to do blank pieces, body shells, chimneys, tenders, that kind of thing, so people can mix and match stuff around? I I would say kind of at, 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 at the moment, it's it's kind of a no. We don't we don't really do that in double O. It's not it's not really what we do. I can get that that may be frustrating for some people because they want to model something quite specific. Um, you know, and it's kind of like a bit like you know, in, in, in our world we have airfix where you 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 build a kit and you paint it however you want, and you can buy various different decals if you don't want to use ones in the box, or you can buy a ready corgi model, which is obviously decorated and it's it's collected in its own right. Um, we you know we, we haven't kind of been in that kit space. Um or component space for, for many, many years. And, and there's no kind of plans at the moment to kind of go go into that space. Because um, there's a guy on uh, YouTube also, uh, Gary Hall. He's yeah, done some amazing Gary. work. You, yeah. You're aware of Gary. Everyone yeah, yeah. knows Gary. Everyone loves Gary stuff. I've met him. Lovely He's fella. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. His collection is very impressive. And yeah. uh, kit bashing is obviously something he does on the regular. Um, I imagine he's assembled his own great gathering uh, several times over the amount of bits and pieces he does. But uh, I'm quite nervous about the painting <laughs> side of things. Otherwise, I'd probably be a bit further along as well. But a little plug there for Gary. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, like Gary, uh, Gary. Follow him on social. Yes, 100%. I've met him and he, he's done some really amazing stuff with what he's managed to do. Yeah, he's had to compromise on some things, which... Um, you know, because of what what's available, but yeah, no, no, kind of hats off to what he's um, achieved. So, when it comes to uh, future locomotive classes, would you ever consider doing a fan vote for a future release? It's uh... <laughs> within reason. I think, I, think I think we need to be a bit further down the line before we start considering um, things like that. Really, it's. Um... You know, it's not. You know, it's not as mainstream as some of the other things we we, we want to do first. So um, let's let's get the let's get the big hitters uh, out of the way first. The, the ones we're getting screened yeah. at for. Yeah. <laughs> but never say never. Yeah, never say never. And it's and it's okay. it's screamed at by the most voices and not the loudest. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, that's what my way of thinking was. If it was a vote, everyone had their one say, and then if it was a clear, oh yeah, we all want that, then. Yeah. yeah. Again, they might get their wishes anyway. See what comes through the pipeline. Um, <clears throat> okay, so again, sounding like a bit of a broken record here. Southern Railway and uh, Great Western Railway representation. I know there's the, um, was it the castle or the hall that's in the pipeline already? Somewhere it's in the catalog. Yeah. Um, there was a mention in the most recent uh, TT Mag um, that Pannier Tank we may get 2025, but again, that's not a confirmation. So this is more southern. I'm going to appeal to you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's been previously mentioned you won't go into that area just yet because of the rolling stock to go with it. My argument is. Um, if you were to produce, say, a Merchant Navy or a Battle of Britain and potentially leave it at that for the time being, there's already Pullman cars in the line, which could easily go with them. And if you were to decide to put freight behind it, um, you've got the private wagons and Pico also do the Southern Railway seven plank wagon. And uh, as touched on earlier with the uh, Mark 1s, they could be redone in green. 
So I appeal to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, it's, we, uh, can we get one of those? Point. It is. It is a fair point that if we were to do either of those locos, there would be something in the marketplace that they could realistically have pulled. Whether it's the most likely or commonly, that that's kind of debatable. But you're right; it's not impossible at all for someone not to be able to model southern if we had one of those locos in our range. Mm. It doesn't even necessarily have to be southern. Um, you've got um, obviously because of uh, Barry Scrapyard, the GWR and the southern locomotives were some of the most preserved out there. So as far as um, North Yorkshire Moors, uh, I know they have a schools class locomotive up there. Um, you've got other, I can't recall if there's uh, Merchant Navy or Battle of Britons, but you've got other southern <coughs> railway locomotives that do rail tours yes. up and down the country as well. So I would like to think I have a strong argument for those two particular choices or failing that uh, possible BR standards that filled yeah. all regions of the UK. I've got a couple of windows. Did, yeah. <laughs> um, the one, oh, my windows are shut now. Um, the BR standard class two. So this would have potential benefits for both sides of the coin. Uh, the tender engines were more Northern based, but in the Southern, they took the tender off, slapped some side tanks on it and became a tank engine. So with the right designing, potentially you could have two locomotives for the price of one, as far as design goes. Is that something it would I mean, seem enticing from a design point of view, or is it still quite a uphill struggle? Yeah, well, that kind of era, you know, this is just our experience from double O. They don't sell as well as the, you know, the, the sort of main ones, but not so we wouldn't do that in the future. Um, but I, like, again, for us, it's still early days and there's mm. bigger, there's bigger um, sort of subjects to choose from. Is, is the honest answer. I mean, I'd love to do, me personally, I'd love to do a Merchant Navy. You know, I'd love to do a Merchant Navy. Um, but um, it's just, we've got, we've got obviously got a plan, what we're, what we're sort of trying to stick to. And and uh, that, that plan, you know, at the start was carefully thought about. And, you know, why why um, sort of deviate unless you really have to? Um, you know, so, so it, we, we believe it's a good, a good plan, and we will get around to in those locos. There's no question about it. It's just just a matter of time. Oh, we're just impatient. <laughs> this side of the till, we're we're chomping at the bit for everything. It's good, really. though. Yeah, yeah, it's healthy. We love it. So, um, you mentioned um, the plan and sticking to the plan. Was the J50 always a part of the plan, and it just got bumped forward? <laughs> actually that was that was a sort of shortfall in the plan i'd say um you know it became apparent that we didn't have a small steam uh locomotive and we had all these wagons and things and and we wanted something nice if people want to do like a little end-to-end -end layout you know you know a little loco to support that and um you know steam era and uh the j50 was one we had a a really good design in, in the double O range. So we decided to, it was, it was one we could sort of quickly push through the uh, through the system, if you like. So we uh, we chose to do it. And it is a good subject as well, you know, and it ticked all the boxes. So we, we decided to pull it forward. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there is potential for little uh, new ideas to get slipped oh, in yeah. there. <clears throat> I, can tell, I can tell you now it is, uh, we've got- Potential. Two, Two other models that are not in our original plan that have been developed. So, excellent, excellent. I don't suppose, without giving anything away, if you have a number of how many locomotives are actually in development right now, uh, <laughs> or roughly. I suppose if there's when well, it's four, four in in is what I call it, the design start design and development stage. Mm -hmm. And are they, again, without giving too much away, are they the ones in the catalogue or surprises? No. 
Yeah, not no comment. comment. Yeah, no <laughs> bit of both. Yeah, <laughs> bit of both. And and it and it will you know it will then we might be at a design stage and it might be then we'll which uh, this one or that one will actually go through the tooling process because when when something goes to tooling, obviously that then takes up an element of uh, engineering capacity in 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 the in the vendors as well as for us as well. So kind of there'd only ever be a certain number of projects running alongside each other at that mm. time. So that's where something may get slid in front of something else. Mm -hmm. It's also watching what the market, you know, when we started this, we didn't know what people really wanted. We do listen to your feedback and what people want. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's enough call to sort of change it, you know, and that's, we're just reacting basically. So, Okay, cool. Um, so um, last question that I have, and then we'll move on to some Facebook questions as a quick fire. Um, <clears throat> in the catalog, uh, the Gresley and Collet coaches that are written down. Uh, we've got the composite coach and the brake coach in Teak and the BR versions. Um, I don't know if this is just a, a curiosity on my part, but because there's only the two listings there, I assume there will be multiple running numbers for both sets? Yeah, we, it, again, those, those early day... Um, sort of models in the like, like phase three, I can't remember now, but uh, um, the phase three models were just sort of, not pencil uh, placeholders, but they weren't the final details of the yeah. models we're going to actually see in, in the range. They were just to show people, you know, this is what, what our plans are. And these are the models we're going to be doing in the future. Mm. So don't take them, you know, as cast in, in, in stone sort of, uh, in iron or whatever. Um, you know, they're all subject to change. Cool, it's good to know. Right, so um, actually, I do have one last personal question. Uh, somehow, I missed this earlier on. Um, what are your thoughts on the impact of social media influencers and YouTubers like myself? Um, is it a positive, or are we more of a nuisance? <laughs> Nine times out of ten, I'd say it's it's a hugely positive thing because it gives people the opportunity to maybe learn things they didn't know or be able to kind of enter into conversations where they you know, they you, you can't have it unless you get out and about. Um, so you know they're, they're, they're great communities. Um, and one of the things I really love about the the TT community as well is that it's um, it, it's very welcoming for for different levels you know you, you've got some people in tt who know their way around modeling and, and they're very skilled they know their way around digital systems and then you've got people who are right at the beginning who who kind of have much much simpler questions you know and in some environments that can be quite a tough space to be able to kind of put your hand up and ask what you fear is a silly question and what, what i kind of see from from what i consume in that the tt space it, it, it's generally a hell of a lot more it, it's very positive and it's very welcoming i think that's great because that's how 99.99% of us are, and that's how we want to be. That's how we'd be in any sort of social kind of position in, in our lives. So bringing it into the kind of hobby and helping each other and having common interests and being able to talk about it is absolutely brilliant. Uh, right, so I've had some uh, questions shot over to me on Facebook. So uh, these are quick fire. Uh, give as little or as much detail as you like. Uh, first one. Uh, class 66 appropriate rolling stock, J JNAs, for example. So I know the containers are on the way, and they do also, but um, potential to expand on, I suppose, uh, modern image rolling stock. Yep, yeah, there, there, there are some in the, in the plans. We've got, we obviously got the MGRs and TTAs and the intermodals as well. We, uh, you, you're aware of them? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we will do some more modern rolling stock. Uh, <laughs> I can't say too much here, but there's uh, there was a project we was looking at. We're not doing anymore. That's all I'm going to say on it. Um, but we will look at we, we we are looking at more modern subjects in, in the rolling stock range. Um, uh, this one I think is. Um... I'll just read it as is. Uh, class 59, shared chassis with class 66. Also class 57, piggybacking on class 47. 
So I think that's more expanding uh, the diesel range. Yeah. Uh, I, when you say uh, 59 shared the same chassis, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't exactly the same, was it? <laughs> I don't think. No. <laughs> so um, it's literally a copy and paste kind of deal from Facebook, these questions. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's got different bogies and the, the underframe these house different, different size fuel tanks and the body no, size. That is a, a no. So, they, they yeah. won't share. We, 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 could do, we could do an inaccurate model, I suppose, of, of a class 59 later on. But um, yeah, for, for me, it's a lot of, lot of changes needed. And the 57 pack, <clears throat> piggybacking on a 47. I know 47s are in the pipeline, aren't they? Escape from my mind. So uh, 57s, would that be a potential to share a chassis? Yeah, well, again, I mean, I haven't, we haven't started sort of researching that project in detail yet, but um, without knowing the details and the, on the differences, I, I can't say for this at this point in time. But yeah, but I, absolutely. If it's, a, if it's a case of changing the headlights or something like that, then yeah. So if a model shares quite a few components with another, would that yeah. be a deciding factor in saying we're going to do this one? Yeah. Obviously, demands yeah. factor as well. If they're, if they're two popular things and you can essentially get more out of one investment, then the, the sensible business decision is, is, to, is to sort of um, prioritise that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, next one, any commitment to other diesel locomotives released not mentioned prior? I think we've covered that, to be honest, uh, unless you wanted to add anything else. No, no, no. <laughs> pleading the fifth. <laughs> um, any potential for Mark free sleeper coaches? Yeah, so <clears throat> again, this is our experience from Double O, but our sleeper Mark free sleeper coaches are the ones that stay in our warehouse, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, yeah they're we very specific. Do, yeah, we do sell a few, but it's it's very, very limited. It, yeah, and with, with niche things like that, you know, you can never say we won't ever do it, but if it, if we if we know it's niche, then it's 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 not going to be as um, high up the um, high up the list. Yeah. This one may seem like a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just for the content. Are there any plans for a deltic? Well, I imagine there would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, you know, if we're talking kind of iconic locomotives, then then yes course um i think i think we a lot of people would like to see that at some stage within tt so so yeah again this one might be a bit touch and go <laughs> <laughs> how long for non lnr steam i mean we got the uh the coronations literally due to drop any day now i believe yeah, yeah. so that one's a bit <laughs> Yeah, so they're, they're, they're the first of those coming through and obviously the um, the coaches to go with it. So it'd be very interesting to see how how they how they kind of get re received on the kind of on the, on the on the bigger scale of things. Um, so it'd be an, an interesting kind of something to look at probably in, in, in sort of six weeks time when they're sort of through in the market reviewed and, and, and people that have got them, people that want them have got them. Uh, well, I'm definitely interested in picking up two of those, the LMS version and one of the BR versions, whichever one comes first, I suppose. So um, now that I've put that on the video, if uh, Lady Red murders me, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, EMU, DEMU or DMU? Any potentials? In time. In time, of course, yeah, 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 right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think well, it's, it just it's going to look a lovely looking thing in TT scale, doesn't it? It's going to be brilliant, you know. And uh, yeah, definitely, we'll look at look at one in the in the near future. My, I mean, this might just be my personal opinion here, but uh, they would be quite niche, although I would be very interested in having a thumper <laughs> for my own personal collection, but that's just me. <laughs> um, electric locomotives well that's that this is like a, a really really you know interesting <clears throat> one you know because you know, obviously we know people do um model electric you know um if you're going to do electric do you go in with early electric or do you go in with 
what you see on the rails today. Um, and that 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 for us is um, kind of quite a scratch your head um, sort of um, thought and decision to have to make at the moment. Um, we will at a stage be, be bringing in that, but it's, it's more about which direction we come at from it. You know, whether it's kind of going in the set vet route and the, the earlier stuff, or whether it's going with class 800s and 755s, et cetera, et cetera, 395s. Um, and, and, you know, and another factor to consider in that as well is that we'll, so with, the, with real modern electric, does it open up opportunities into the European markets? We have Arnold TT as well. Um, so they are all kind of little kind of additional kind of factors which are um, you know, within, within our thought processes on that route. That leads me very nicely into my last one. Uh, UK and Euro compatible models. So um, the container wagons, um, I think, came out on Arnold a little while ago and they flew out the window, didn't they? And they're now heading over to the Hornby Bridge. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, one thing that immediately comes to mind that could go on both websites and sell, I think, quite easily, uh, Eurostar. Yeah. So is that something that's being discussed? It, it is a conversation we, 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 we've had. Um, I mean, there, there are some sort of factors to, for consideration in this, and that is that you know, if, you, if you look at the TT market in, in Europe, how big is it in um, in France at the moment, and um, where does the Eurostar actually you know, go to? Of course, it does go slightly beyond. But then, if it does go beyond, um, you know, kind of people that are doing um, cross border modelling in that sense, TT is a bit more skewed towards the eastern side of Germany as well. So, it, it would seem a very obvious thing to do, but it would also Again, all these many little factors and things that come into our considerations is, is sort of what certain markets or what stage they're at. You know, or another way of flipping it around is you could say that by doing something like that, does it really open the French market to the scale a bit more? You know, and then that then becomes a, a much wider European conversation on how then you know, we, we are talking about Southern or LNER or that, but when you get into Europe, you've got um, you've got countries that are obviously much much broader room. Um, still with lots of crossovers so that there's there's lots of sort of things to to think about and, and but the the exciting bit is these are all opportunities <clears throat> yeah, even on our um class 66 model we've done the euro spec um bodies and things so they you know eventually that will that will be uh you know released in europe so will those models be heading over to the arnold website as well or have you kept the um that's all they're all very section specific aren't they yeah it, it, it's very tbc they come in they come in kind of different packs but um you know the obvious thing to do with the 66 at that stage of tooling is to look at the the opportunities beyond the uk given that we have um other brands in other markets yeah, even even in europe um, even the uk versions have proven really popular I mean, we've had to do um you know like tired wheel sets for, for europe because that's a big thing for them out there um you know just so that they can they can replace the wheel sets with tired wheel sets when they get our uk variant so it's that's the, that's another nice thing about tt is we're getting a, a lot of orders from overseas excellent so all round tt's performing exactly how you want it and uh, be patient. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, very much for your time. It is greatly appreciated. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thanks for everything no, you do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. So I can't thank Martin and Carl enough for coming on and talking to me. Um, basically a YouTube nobody at this point with my uh, mere 400 subscribers. Hopefully that will have gone up by the time you're watching this. But um, cannot thank them enough. Some good information there. Hopefully you guys got some questions answered. Hopefully that didn't add to the questions, but we'll see. Um, TT120 is doing well. It's going to continue to grow. The, ra the range is going to expand. Obviously, hopefully into the 
southern and western regions, but again, we have to be patient. I don't like being patient. So, thank you for watching. Um, if you've made it this far, far, if you've made it this far, please like and subscribe. <laughs> Share the video in uh, whatever group you can. It helps the channel a great deal to get out there, and uh, it helps. YouTube suggest my videos to people that haven't already found my content. So you'd be doing a, me a massive solid if you could do any of those. So okay, thank you for watching and I will see you again next time. Take care guys. Goodbye.